Okay, we'll make a start, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqtatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Assalamu alaikum once again to all my respected brothers and sisters who are joining us today. And alhamdulillah, jazakallah khair as well to uh, Sheikh Zahid Fattah for joining us. Assalamu alaikum to Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam. Alhamdulillah, today's session we've titled Are You on the Manhaj? Um, it was a bit of a tongue-in-cheek decision, uh, but it does still reflect and represent a very important question that many young people uh, are affected by today, that they are thinking about. They're thinking about how to maintain balance, how to navigate controversy, especially in today's social media day and age, where there are constantly controversies going around. So Sheikh Zaid Fattah introduced him very briefly, and then he share a few words, introduced the topic, and share some reflections and some thoughts. And I'll have some follow-up questions, and then near the end, in the last 15 to 20 minutes or so, we'll take some questions from the audience, insha'Allah ta'ala. So, Sheikh Zahid, alhamdulillah, we're very, very honored to have him today. Um, he is from the demographic who are not so old that they can no longer um, relate with us, but at the same time, he is not so young that he has not had any experience uh, learning, studying, teaching, being an imam. Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Zahid has studied extensively in the UK. He has, he has a degree in law from the University of Birmingham. He also has a degree in Sharia focusing on fiqh and usul fiqh from the European Institute of Human Sciences, which is based in France, but I believe you did it in the uh, branch in Birmingham. He's also spent some time abroad. He's also been an imam uh, in the Wisdom Center in Birmingham, namely. Um, he's also had experience teaching. Um, and I believe you're even involved to some degree in your local Islamic society, in your university, FOSIS. And also, so Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Zayed has a wealth of experience. Um, he's closer to us in age, so he has some, uh, he can relate to our experiences as well. And so I think this is something Sheikh Zayed has some experience with as well, perhaps discussing these kind of issues. So I'll hand over to Sheikh, inshallah, if you can begin with some exactly. general reflections on the topic of maintaining balance, navigating controversy, and um, and maybe along the way you can answer if you're on the manager. <laughs> Inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Jazakumullah khairan. First of all for this uh, invitation and for organizing these, um, these sessions. Uh, and I've heard that they've been very useful so far, mashaAllah. So jazakumullah khairan to the uh, Muslim Youth Network for uh, organizing these uh, these programs. Uh, I'll start, inshallah ta'ala, with a few words. Um, perhaps some of what I'm going to say will cover some of the questions which are uh, which ha which have brought you to this uh, discussion in the first place. Hopefully, uh, it will cover some important questions. And if anything remains unanswered, then, you know, uh, like um, like was mentioned in the introduction, we'll open up, inshallah, the floor for any additional discussions. Um, first of all, this topic, you know, manhaj, what does manhaj mean? Manhaj, uh, manhaj just means methodology, it means way. Yeah, are you on the, on, the, on the manhaj? Are you on the way? Are you on the path? Are you on the correct path? Um, are you on the straight path that... Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to in the Quran uh, when he says subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, المستقيم, guide us to the to the straight path yeah what we recite every every day in in our prayers and outside our prayers and so you know a lot of the times things uh, maybe become confusing when we give things more importance than they deserve that's usually where things go wrong because when we give something more importance than it deserves we've we've placed a high expectation of it yeah we've we've put it somewhere in a position where it shouldn't be and so when things don't go wrong with those issues uh, don't go right with those issues they go wrong it, it, you know, it can cause us a problem, it can cause us some difficulty, it can cause us confusion. Had we placed it in its right position and given it its uh, appropriate level of importance in the, from the beginning, then it wouldn't have caused us as much of a fuss and as much of a problem. And so therefore, any time we're addressing you know, any type of controversial discussion or anything, the first question that should come to my mind is, this discussion that's you know uh, caused controversy where can we place it on the scale of importance according to the quran and according to what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam brought not according to the scale of importance uh, in relation to the muslim community because as we know sometimes the muslim community or many muslims make something very important 
whilst the Sharia hasn't made it that important. Or they might not give it so much importance when the Sharia has given it major importance. And so the reference for knowing whether something is important and how important it is, is always the, the teachings of Allah, the revelation. Everything beyond revelation is open to error. It can, it can uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not something which is perfect. It doesn't matter how great a book or a person of knowledge or a website or an organization, it doesn't matter how lovely and how amazing, how great they are, they can never have the uh, perfection that Allah's revelation has, which is manifested in his book, the Quran, and in the teachings of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. So that's something to, to bear in mind. Okay, so to summarize this first point that I've made, anytime we want to discuss a topic, we need to consider where is it on the scale of importance? How do we side, decide importance? We decide according to the teachings of the Quran. For example, if the Quran has mentioned something repeatedly over and over and over and over again, that's a, you know, a clear indication that that's a very important thing. The Quran has you know, constantly spoken about, for example, Iman and righteous actions. Amanu wa amilu salihat. Iman and amal salih. So we know these two things are considered foundations in Islam. Allah repeatedly ta'ala speaks in, speaks about tawheed, iman, and shirk, belief in Allah, and shirk, the opposite of, of you know, uh, monotheism and, and pure belief in Allah. And because these things are repeated over and over again in the Qur'an, we know these things are essential. Allah repeats talking about salah and zakah so much in the Qur'an. Allah has spoken about certain major sins repeatedly. So we know these things are important. And this is a principle which uh, lots of, uh, in a, lot, a lot of the time we, we don't act upon. And that is if Allah has not mentioned something in the Qur'an and the Prophet ﷺ has not emphasized it, it can't be that important. It can't be that important. Why can it not be that important? Because Allah Ta'ala has revealed the Qur'an as a book of guidance for us. So if he has spoken about some things which we might consider less important, and he has left out things which we think are important, that means that's a deficiency in this guidance. Imagine Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala has taught us in the Qur'an about uh, the rulings of giving salam. He's taught us about, uh, you know, some of the etiquettes of eating, like not going over the top uh, when it comes to eating and so on. Uh, وَشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا yeah, Eat and drink, but do not, uh, do not squander, do not be excessive. Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken about some of the ahkam that relate to financial transactions, inheritance, menstruation, marriage and divorce. So if he's spoken about these things and he's left out other things, what does that mean? That means those other things which we perceive to be so important, maybe they're not that important in reality. And so I hope that point, uh, you know, is kept in mind. Um, and so that's the that's a sort of uh, starting point. Anytime, you know, uh, we want to focus on Islam, focus on our worship, focus on our relationship with Allah, we have to focus on the clear teachings of Islam because Allah made the Quran clear. He made the religion clear. If it wasn't so clear, it wouldn't be suitable for every person. It wouldn't be everyone's religion if it was only, uh, you know, philosophers who could truly understand Islam. If it was only, uh, you know, scholars who could truly understand Islam. Uh, people who had studied for years and years if it was only them who could understand Islam, then this religion is not for everyone. But this religion is for everyone. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu dkhulu fi as-silmi kaffa. Ya ayyuhal nasu attaqu rabbakum. O people, O you who believe, the address is to everyone, all of mankind. Ya ayyuhal nas. Okay, ya bani Adam, O children of Adam. The Quran is addressing us all. The Quran is addressing everyone. Young and old, male and female, educated, uneducated. And so therefore, you know, the teachings of Islam are certainly simple. Okay, now, um, another thing which is important when it comes to this topic of menhaj and methodology. So we've understood that Islam is nice and simple. The teachings of Islam are simple. 
we must focus on the things which are clear and the things which aren't so clear uh, you know not so emphasized in the Quran and Sunnah it probably means we don't need to worry too much about it you know what a disaster is a disaster is if a person is following the clear teachings of the Quran and Sunnah like Salah, pillars of Iman he believes in the pillars of Iman practices the pillars of Islam and then a minor controversial topic which has been blown out of proportion on social media or in the masjid or in his family or amongst friends or whatever that small thing makes him doubt whether he's a Muslim or not makes him doubt whether he's on the right path or not makes him doubt whether this is enough to go to Jannah or whether he needs to do something else this is a big problem and this unfortunately happens to a lot of people why does it happen? because we have misplaced issues and given them more importance they did than they deserve or less importance than they deserve so anyone who opens up you know the their social media account for example uh, with lots of muslim following and, and, and lots of muslim friends maybe there are topics that are being discussed which they are made to think are the most important things in islam when in reality they're useless useless but it's just the nature of people and the nature of social media that hot topics and controversial topics are the things which people like to talk about you know and also people like to sound smart as well so if you talk about the simple things you know people are not going to think that you're mashallah a student of knowledge and senior and very smart and so on the prophet sallallahu didn't have to do this I'm not from those who over-exaggerate, put in too much effort, okay, an unnatural effort in. The Prophet ﷺ didn't never had to do that. His teachings were so simple. All the Prophets, their teachings were so simple. And yet they became the guides for all of humanity. The same with the Sahaba, their teaching, their, their knowledge was, was nice and simple. And they were the guides of humanity. So it's important to not be deceived by what people are talking about, what people are interested in. That's not necessarily the most important thing. So that's the first uh, you know, point, uh, and, and I've discussed a few related elements to that. Now, uh, another thing that's important is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about and uh, gives more attention to reality. Reality, not images and appearances and labels. And this is why the Prophet وسلم, says, Inna Allah, la ila wa la ila Allah doesn't look at your images, your appearances, and your bodies. Ila wa but He looks at your hearts and your actions. And this hadith is reported by Imam Muslim. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Hujurat, Ya yuhan nasu inna khalaqnakum. من ذكر وأنثى we created you from male and female وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا and we made you into nations and tribes so that you may get to know one another إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the one who is most pious the most righteous the most conscious of Allah تعالى see importance is being given to reality not which nation you're from which tribe you're from this hadith that I just mentioned about Allah doesn't look at your images and bodies. We can understand it as being Allah doesn't look at your physical bodies. And that definitely is part of the uh, meaning. And that's the uh, apparent meaning of the hadith. But we can also apply this hadith to our discussion on menhaj and sects and groups and movements and ideologies. Allah does not look at labels and images and appearances. He doesn't look at the name of the group that you associate yourself to. He doesn't look at the name that you go by, the label that you go by. He doesn't look at the, the labels that other people throw at you. Because we're in a time where everyone has to be labeled. Everyone has to be labeled. Yeah, I, I'm certain that most of the time I give a dars or a lecture, uh, those who already have some idea about me beforehand, will have uh, you know, some sort of label on me, have placed it on me already, and maybe they will interpret everything I say based on that label. And you, why? why? I, don't, I don't want a label. I don't want to be associated with anyone or anything other than Islam. But that's a, the that's a nature uh, you know, of our time. It's the reality of our time. And it's the reality of human beings. It's, it's, 
it's a historical thing. It's not something new. Yeah. And so uh, the, the labels that people direct at you, they're not the things that Allah Ta'ala look at. Uh, Ta'ala looks at. He looks at your hearts and your actions. And so therefore, a label, a name, a group, a sect, which you might think is a bit dodgy or not quite on the right path, if there is a member from amongst them who has iman and righteous actions, then he is a hundred times better than a person from a group that you think is a group that's upon the sunnah and upon the truth, if that person doesn't have the same iman and righteous actions. This is something that no Muslim should disagree about. Anyone who disagrees about that, that means there's a major misunderstanding about the reality of Islam and the way Allah Ta'ala holds us to account. Okay, I hope I'm not taking too long. I'm going to mention one or two more points and then we'll move on, inshallah. Now, so I've spoken about two things now. The first is, you know, following the clear, simple teachings of Islam because they are the things that will take us to Jannah. The complicated stuff, which only few people understand, that's not where Jannah lies. Okay, that's just additional knowledge. Additional information, you know, flexing of muscles, this and that, not a problem. Person will be rewarded for that, inshallah. Yeah, a person will definitely uh, benefit from additional knowledge, etc. That's absolutely fine. But the knowledge which we need to be successful in our dunya and successful in our akhirah is the knowledge which is clear, the knowledge which is simple. And this is why a number of the Salaf, rahimahumullah, used to say, and it's attributed to Imam Malik and others, kanu yakrahuna al gharibah min al ilm. The scholars. The scholars used to dislike strange knowledge. And some of the scholars, rahimahumullah, said, عَجِبْتُ لِمَنْ تَرَكَ الْأُصُولِ وَاشْتَغَلَ بِالْفُضُولِ I'm amazed at the person who leaves the usul, leaves the clear teachings, the important teachings that Islam is built upon, the six pillars of Iman, the five pillars of Islam, worshipping Allah, keeping away from major sins, the things that we all know, the things that we all know. The things which make Islam, Islam. I'm amazed at the one who leaves these things or ignores these things and busies and occupies himself with fudul, superficial type of knowledge, additional things that won't take you closer to Allah, that won't purify your heart, that won't enter you into Jannah, that won't keep you away from Allah's punishment. So this is, uh, you know, a really important methodology to live by we're talking about manhaj this should be our manhaj in life the usul clinging on to the usul of islam and if the fudul are confusing us then brush them to the side uh, if you're unable to do something or understand something then leave it and move on to something that you're able to understand so the point is that uh, this is where our focus should lie and the second point was about images being secondary, appearances, labels being secondary, and reality is what matters. The other thing is that, you know, it's actually a blessing from Allah Ta'ala that we have issues in Islam which are clear cut, black and white, and we have issues which are not so clear cut. Some people, you know, they feel really agitated about differences of opinion between scholars and the Sahaba disagree, and maybe sometimes a hadith. Some of them seem to not make sense. Uh, you know, um, uh, a person's unable to uh, reconcile between some of these hadith which appear to be contradictory uh, and things like that. This, this agitates a lot of people. It shouldn't agitate us. It shouldn't agitate us. If we understand that this is a blessing, it won't agitate us. If we understand that true Islam is based on the usul, and entering Jannah is based on the usul, and us as callers to Allah, and that's all of us here, me speaking and you guys listening, us as callers to Allah, we've been commanded to teach the usul. These things which are clear in Islam. As for these additional things, it is a big blessing that Allah has given us scope for differing in them. Why is it a big blessing? Number one, because not everyone is living in the same circumstance. People have different situations, different circumstances, different needs. Societies change, lifestyles are different. 
And so imagine every single thing that we do in life had one obligatory way in which it had to be done. That would be such a big burden because people are different. Allah created us differently. And so we need that flexibility. We need that flexibility. You know, in some, some cultures and some customs, something is disliked, you know, not recommended. In another culture, there's flexibility. It's absolutely fine. We need that type of flexibility. Secondly, the nature of human beings is that we make mistakes. وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا Allah Ta'ala says, Allah, uh, Allah uh, you know, created human beings weak. And Allah says about the Quran, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِي غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Do they not ponder over the Quran? Had it been from anyone other than Allah, they would have found so many contradictions in it. Being contradictory is the nature of human beings. Making mistakes is the nature of human beings. When there are some things which are clear and other things which are less clear, that gives us additional freedom to make mistakes. And this is why the Prophet said, If a mujtahid, if a judge, if a person of knowledge tries you know, to come to the truth, but makes a mistake, Allah will still give him one reward. And if he gets things right, then Allah will reward him twice. He will get double the reward. So we need that scope to make mistakes because we're human beings. We need that scope to develop, to misunderstand something today and to understand it tomorrow, to get it wrong today and to get it right tomorrow. That flexibility we need, it's part of the, you know, the weakness of human beings. Also, like I said, uh, as well as the issue of uh, giving people more scope and flexibility, and those of you who study fiqh and see differences of opinion between scholars, you know, you'll know that there are times where you're convinced with an opinion, but there's another person who's in such a difficult situation that, you know, they need more scope. You don't need that scope, but he needs that scope. Okay, she doesn't need that scope, but she does. So when we have a, a variety of opinions that exist amongst the scholars, a variety of interpretations of the Quran and Sunnah, because scholars are not legislators, scholars merely convey the message of the Quran and Sunnah. So when we have a variety of scholarly interpretations of the Quran and the Sunnah, that gives people that extra scope. The third benefit is that it keeps people on their toes. Imagine everything was black and white and easy. No one would bother studying and researching and thinking and pondering and seeking knowledge and traveling to study. It also teaches us humility. It teaches us humility because uh, it, it teaches us that you can be wrong. Sometimes you, you're wrong and then afterwards you get it right. And that's okay. Those mistakes are fine. It also teaches us to respect one another. Can you imagine that from the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until Yawm al-Qiyamah, everyone has the same view and the same opinion and the same inclination. That doesn't, this is impossible. You know, then we would not give people freedom to breathe. No, everything's black and white in Islam. You have to do it like this. And if you don't, then you're off the path and you're misguided. But when we have elements in Islam, which people, which are open to interpretation, open to different views, then there's no problem. Oh, you think that this is... I, I'm not comfortable doing that action, but you think it's permissible? Alhamdulillah, no problem. There's scope. And so these are many... These are just a few of the many benefits of, uh, you know, Islamic teachings being split up into two types. The clear-cut matters on which there's no budging, like the uh, major sins that are clear-cut and agreed upon, uh, like the pillars of Islam and the pillars of Iman, you know, like matters of Tawheed and, sh and Shirk and these types of major things, these things, alhamdulillah, these are things that uphold the religion. If we gave flexibility in these issues, then there would be no, no, there would no longer be Islam. We would disagree, is there Akhirah or is there no Akhirah? Is Allah one, two or three? Is the Prophet وسلم, a role model or is he just another person who had opinions that are open to debate? Yeah, that means there's no more Islam. If even these things are open to interpretation, that means there's no more Islam. But these things are not open to interpretation. 
And then there's a category of things where people can disagree and have different approaches. And this is where, you know, a person should take things a bit more, a bit more easy. To know whether you're on the menhaj or not, and I end with this, a person who's on the path, a person who's on the truth, is the one who gets the first category of things right. As for the second category of things, then he should try his best to get that right. But getting it wrong does not take a person off the path. The Prophet ﷺ said about the Imam ibn Tha'laba, who said, I'm going to pray five times a day and give zakah and fast Ramadan. And wallahi, I'm not going to do any more than that. This is Imam ibn Tha'laba. He said this to the Prophet ﷺ in the presence of the Sahaba. He said, wallahi, I'm not going to do more than that. Wala anqus, and I won't do any less. It's a brave statement to make. But he said, Wallahi, I won't do more or less. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Aflaha wallahi in sadaq. He believed in Allah and the Messenger, and he performed salah and zakah and fasted Ramadan. And you know, we know from the teachings of the Prophet that Hajj is an obligation as well. And the Prophet ﷺ swore by Allah that the, this person is successful. So if the Prophet swore that he is successful, who are we to say about someone who believes in Allah and his messenger and believes in the final day and acts upon the pillars of Islam? Who are we to say he's not successful? Who are we to say he's not guided? Who are we to say he's astray? He's not on the path. I don't need your judgment about who's on the path, who's on the manhaj and who's not. I already have the prophets, but judgment on who's on the manhaj and who isn't. And so I hope this is an important starting point, which we keep in mind so that we don't mix things up and occupy ourselves with, thing, with things which are not deserving uh, the same importance as the things mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu in these important usul. And I said at the beginning, you know, before we went live, I said to Brother Tahseen, I said, I don't think I'm going to take long. I'm just going to take 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And I ended up dragging on a bit more. But that's all I have for now, inshallah. Jazakumullah khaira. Barakallahu feekum, Sheikh Zahid. Uh, no problem, we don't mind. That was very useful. Jazakallah khairan. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to press with a few questions. Some of them will be a bit more specific okay. based on questions yeah. that others have posed before, if you don't mind. Uh, I'll start off with something uh, basic. So, you've shared, alhamdulillah, some very important points around someone taking responsibility in prioritizing the conversations they concern themselves with. So, focus yeah. on the also main points instead of going into things which are secondary or tertiary. At the same time, would you agree that there is an importance for a lay person or someone who's just starting out in their studies to seek guidance or mentorship from someone who's more experienced in knowledge and i think a lot of the anxiety and the agitation comes around when there's a culture on social media around people saying don't listen to such and such person or this person has made such a mistake how do you navigate that how do you navigate knowing that there's an importance in seeking mentorship but not being really sure about because you you might not feel comfortable discerning what is authentic or not authentic that's the language that's used isn't it so how should a young person or a lay person or someone who's just starting out in his studies navigate this problem of choosing where he learns the religion? Yeah, Jazakallah khair. I mean, first of all, uh, you know, there's no doubt that uh, human effort and human ijtihad comes into play here. You know, we can't have a list of people and say, right, these guys are trustworthy teachers and these guys are not trustworthy. So definitely there'll be an element of thinking it'll be an element of consideration research you know do your do your homework yeah you know look, look a person up the point is generally speaking you know uh finding a teacher does not mean finding someone who's perfect it just means someone who is pious in their religion and this is a very important condition because piety and honesty and sincerity means that allah ta'ala will grant them guidance and success to do what's right and to say what's right. And secondly, a person who is uh, who has the same principles that the basic Muslim understands, someone who respects the Quran, someone who respects the Sunnah of the Prophet. Okay. If someone comes along, for example, and you want to take him as a mentor, as a teacher, you want to benefit from his classes and lectures, and he's turning around and saying that, you know, there's no such thing as hadith, there's no such thing as sunnah. Uh, you know, we only need the Quran, then immediately even the, the, the basic Muslim will realize that, hold on, I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, the, the teachings of the Prophet are things which there's no scope for discussing. Okay. Uh, 
also, you know, uh, you know, looking looking around and, and asking other people of expertise, you know, asking other people of expertise and other trustworthy people, you know, do you think, uh, what do you know anything about this teacher? Do you think it's worth attending? This is one of the most common questions I get in my uh, in my messages. Do you think I should join these classes? Do you think I should join this class? Do you think I should join that? And generally, my answers are, yeah, yes, yeah. Unless I know for sure that this person is is very problematic, and, and that's, uh, you, you know, not usually the case. It's not usually the case. Uh, then the answer is yes. We don't have to go into too much detail about his exact views on, you know, intricate issues and, and things like that. This is not appropriate. You know, we have some people who are really extreme and they harm themselves and other people when it comes to cutting off the path of benefit from them. Cutting off the path of benefit just because of minor, you know, disagreements. Uh, and so that's something which uh, shouldn't, shouldn't put a person off. Also, you know, this is the journey of knowledge. You learn. You learn. I, I don't, you know, I don't know how many teachers I've spent time studying with. I don't agree with everything they say. This idea that, you know, when you study with someone, he has to, you know, uh, teach you everything to the, in the most perfect way and correctly. No, no. You know, when you have a teacher, when you have a guide, like I said, if he's a person of character, a person of religion, deen, iman, taqwa, and has essential knowledge and has good knowledge, and has good character, that's more than sufficient. That's beneficial. That's You can benefit so much from that person. As you study, as you develop, you'll then make a decision afterwards, inshallah, and Allah will guide you to knowing whether some of what he said was right, some of what he said wasn't right. You know, these are, these are just general guidelines. Okay, so to summarize this answer, the general guidelines here are looking for a person's iman and uh, ikhlas, and taqwa and yes these are internal things but there are outward things which there are outward signs which uh, give you an idea of a person's sincerity and ikhlas and, and good akhlaq and secondly a person should have knowledge either because you know that they have spent 10 15 20 years working hard to study either because that you see other scholars and students of knowledge respecting them and referring back to them and advising people to, to benefit from them uh, these are all indicators, uh, you know, uh, to, to help you uh, know the person who's competent to teach and to be taken as a mentor. Uh, and then after you've done that, I would say don't pay too much attention to people's criticisms. OK, this guy said this, this guy said that he made a mistake here. He's got mistakes in this. He's got mistakes in that. Don't pay too much attention to these things. OK, otherwise we'll be running around. No one is free from from being criticized. And as well as the iman and the taqwa and the knowledge of the teacher, we ourselves have to have iman and taqwa and ikhlas and ask Allah to guide us to, to uh, you know, the best path when it comes to seeking knowledge. Because at the end of the day, you know, this is a human effort to choose the best teacher, to choose the right place to study. This is a human effort. Just, you know, be sincere with Allah, ask Allah to guide you and get stuck into it instead of worrying too much about uh, and, and hesitating too much about this topic. Jazakallah no. khairan, Sheikh. That's very, very helpful. Maybe on a, as, as a follow-up question. So you mentioned about how some people have this uh, mindset of qat'u tariq So they cut people off. They say, don't listen to such and such yeah. a person at all. Um, would you agree that this is a manifestation, amongst other things, of having sort of a narrow mindset? And if, that, if you do agree, what kind of practical points or tips would you give to a young person on how to develop open-mindedness or how to develop... Um, open-mindedness in general whilst also staying true to a normative islam or staying true to the general principles of the yeah. uh, principles yeah. we can't budge so how should you how can one practically develop an open-mindedness yeah. yeah. a thorough obviously of how this be yeah. definitely definitely the you know open-mindedness there are some uh, points that we can keep in mind that help us become open-minded but at the same time the thing which truly makes a person more open-minded is varied studies okay Studying with a variety of teachers uh, is the most uh, effective thing to help you, but, uh, you know, have an open mind and, 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 and be more open to accepting other Muslims. Yeah, and this is why uh, the famous principle that the scholars say is, Man ilmuhu, qalla inkaruhu. Whoever's knowledge increases, 
his criticism of other people decreases. Imagine, picture yourself. You've spent your whole life studying in one place with one teacher or with two or three teachers who have exactly the same views on everything, exactly the same mindset. You are not going to be able to comprehend that there is something such as truth outside of what you've learned. And this is the way, uh, you know, uh, this is the nature of lack of knowledge. This is the nature of lack of knowledge. You know, young people, when they've always been taught something, they can't comprehend that something else is the truth. This is what we, my teacher said this. My parents said this. This is, you know, this is it. I don't believe what you're saying. Because they can't comprehend that something, uh, something else is right. Uh, and so when you've restricted yourself to one teacher, to some teachers, uh, your whole life, to, to, to just one view your whole life, don't be surprised, you know, when you find yourself criticizing so many things. And sometimes people criticize things which are part of the sunnah in Islam and accepted in Islam without hesitation, by consensus, sometimes by scholarly consensus, but because they've been brought up to think that this is wrong, they just find it difficult to accept. You know, I remember in a class once, I, I, someone asked me, did the Prophet Wasallam pray in his shoes? So I said, yes. And Anas ibn Malik was asked the same question in hadith reported by Bukhari. He says, did the Prophet Wasallam pray in his shoes? And Anas said, yes. So I said it in class and said, someone said, no, I don't believe that. <laughs> so I don't believe that. Even though there's no difference of opinion between scholars that praying in your shoes is permissible. And that this hadith is an authentic hadith. The Prophet Wasallam prayed in his shoes. But his, his whole life he's been brought up to think that, no, how can you pray in your shoes? That's disrespectful. Yeah, and in another lesson uh, the other day, yesterday, I think someone asked me about making wudu if a dog licks you. And I said, none of the scholars of Islam say you have to make wudu if a dog licks you. So he said, well, that's weird, though, because I've been brought up to them. Okay, so imagine even things which are definitely wrong, you'll stick by them sometimes because that's all you've been taught. So, you know, one of the things uh, that I found really beneficial for myself is to benefit from different teachers. You know, I uh, have sometimes studied with some mashayikh who other people said, you know, that's a bit, you know, I'm a bit worried that you, you've spent some time studying with that teacher. He said this, he said this. And wallahi, sometimes I sit in the lesson with this shaykh and I, it's almost like someone's punching me in the back. Well, one teacher was, uh, you know, he was a bit critical of some of the Hanbali scholars like Abdullah ibn Ahmad and Ibn Taymiyyah. And being someone who most of his fiqh studies are Hanbali, I was in the class and I was, you know, taking, uh, taking shots from the person without saying a word. And that's fine because I benefited so many other things. When he spoke about Ibn Taymiyyah, you know, in a, in a way which I didn't really like, when he spoke about Abdullah ibn Ahmad and others in a way which I didn't really like, I ignored that stuff. I ignored that stuff. It's not going to kill me. You know, he, I benefited from him in other elements of hadith and Arabic language and things like that and move on. Uh, and so, uh, you know, طيب, uh, this story has now made me forget what, uh, what I was saying. Uh, Tahseen, help us out. What was the question in the beginning? <laughs> the question was... Uh, as well, eh? <laughs> uh, no, no, I uh, remember now. It's about maintaining how to develop open-mindedness. Yeah, how to develop mind. So, so this, was, this, was, <laughs> this was that example that studying with different teachers really helps you uh, to, to, to develop that. Also, and this is the last, the, the last point here, you know, sometimes someone trusts their teacher so much, their sheikh, because he says, this sheikh is pious, he's righteous, he's a worshiper, he has taqwa, good akhlaq, etc. And so you trust him so much that you think anything he says has to be right. But guess what? When you go and study with a scholar who has maybe different opinions, you'll start to think, subhanAllah, he loves the Qur'an as well. He loves the Sunnah as well. He wants to teach Islam as Allah revealed it as well. He's pious, he's righteous, he's so humble, he has good akhlaq. So your heart starts to soften. But if your whole life you've kept away from everyone, the whole ummah, except your small group, your small sect, you're not even going to appreciate that these guys love Islam, these guys love Allah, they love the Prophet, they try their best to follow the Sunnah. You can't comprehend that. To you, they don't care about the sunnah. He doesn't, he's not interested about the sunnah. He is, uh, you know, he gives more, 
importance to his group and his movement and his whatever over the sunnah, which is not true, which is not true, you know. But the problem is you don't know this individual. You haven't spent time with them. You haven't heard from them. And so when you open yourself up a little bit and study with various people and study with different people, you'll find that, alhamdulillah, the usul are the same. The key teachings are the same. And those things where they differ, I have my own personal preference, my own personal view. And I'm not, I don't quite agree with that teacher, but that doesn't stop me from benefiting from that person. Uh, as a quick sort of related question, I just wanted to use this opportunity to get you to comment maybe on the role of or the importance of age and experience in holding strong opinions or in um, your studies. Yeah. You know, Jazakallah khair. Uh, and I, I wrote something not long ago about, on this about on social media. And I said that, you know, the teachers who I benefited from most are the older teachers the senior teachers who have spent 30 years, 40 years seeking knowledge and studying and teaching. Uh, you know, really, you can't go wrong with these types of people. At the end of the day, young people like myself, you know, you can benefit bits and bobs of information and some, some knowledge here and there, and we can, we can have circles of knowledge together and benefit from each other. That's fine. But ultimately, you know, you'll find that this phase that we that we go through of uncertainty and uh, you know shall i do this shall i do that the guy who's 60 years old and he's been studying from the age of 15 he's already been through the same discussions don't think that the, the issues we're having are new i was speaking to a friend you know the other day he said i was reading majallat al-manar by sheikh muhammad rashid rida rahimahullah who passed away you know early on in the century 1935 he says i was amazed the same problems we have in the Muslim community were the same things that they were discussing then. So things are not new. So the challenges we face, they've already faced. So when you seek out the senior scholar, the scholar who's, uh, you know, who's local, you know, so that he understands uh, uh, you know, well the, the circumstance we're talking about, he's a local scholar or a scholar who's from your location, your city, your country, but he has years of experience, years of knowledge, as well as the other attributes that we mentioned before. You know, you will, uh, you know, you need to cling on to that person, cling on to that person, and take with their advice. Take with that person's advice because they will help you to sort of uh, navigate through uh, any confusions or misunderstandings or uncertain uncertainties, and they will keep you on the path. And more importantly, they will attach you with what's important. These are the types of teachers who usually you'll find them focusing on things which are important, iman and ikhlas and worship, okay, as well as important knowledge. And so therefore, you know, uh, and this is not my opinion or my statement. This is something which the early scholars of the past used to say all the time, you know, Sufyan al-Thawri or maybe Sufyan ibn Uyayna, one of them, he said, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that a person should hold on to and cling on to the per person of knowledge who has years of knowledge under his belt. And he said that if you see a young person speaking in a gathering of senior scholars and, and people of experience, then don't expect any good from that person. Okay, because knowledge is not just bits and bobs of information. You might see a young person, they have very nice information and they have a good way of expressing themselves, but that's not what knowledge is necessarily. That's not one of those knowledges that necessarily, and I, you know, have uh, some different teachers, some of them who are a bit younger, and some of them who are a bit older, and the younger ones often, they word their, their, their lessons and their, uh, you know, their knowledge, they word it in a, in a way which sounds much more academic and like they've done much so much more research and so on, but wallahi, the true knowledge I found is with the older scholars. I found true knowledge is with them, and the true role models are there. You know, the younger ones, they might uh, sound like they're more intelligent and they might sound like, uh, you know, they've, they've studied more even. Sometimes might, people might even be deceived to think that he studied more than this other person. It's not necessarily the case. And so therefore, you know, I'm glad that you brought that point up. If you can find a teacher who's not just righteous and has good akhlaq and has good knowledge, but is also senior in their 50s and in their 60s and their 70s, then, you know, do not think twice about, you know, spending time with that person. And there's benefit everywhere as well. 
has benefited everyone as well. Very important points. Um, just to take a question from one of the audience members, which was related to what I was going to bring up. So we'll spend some time discussing open-mindedness and tolerance. Maybe just to balance that a little bit, is there still a role within the Sharia or within scholarship for maintaining the boundaries of what is authentic Islam? So some people will come and say to you, refutation is from the deen. So what is the role of criticism and of refutation and these kind of things within religion? Who should take part in that? Uh, and how does that work generally? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. You know, uh, the Prophet sallallahu Allah Taala in the Quran first and foremost. Uh, you know, obligated, obligated, correcting uh, errors and calling to the good and forbidding evil. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also, uh, you know, commanded this: a person should change any evil that they see to the best of their ability, either with you know physically or with their tongue or at least, you know, to have dislike for it with their heart. So this definitely has a role to play. And I don't know of a single scholar who has not criticized mistakes or spoken about errors and, and wrong beliefs and wrong practices. This is definitely part of Islam. However, as, uh, you know, a Muslim who doesn't have a high level of experience in knowledge and isn't someone who is... Uh, considered a role model in knowledge by other Muslims and by other students of knowledge, we should focus on criticizing or clarifying those things which are clear. There are plenty of wrongs in the world that can occupy us from things which are matters of valid difference of opinion. There is so much corruption in the world, you know, uh, for example, when we uh, uh, want to correct an error or speak about a mistake and so on and so forth. Is everyone upon piety? Is everyone upon Iman? Has everyone left the major sins? And the only things which are remaining are, is this a bid'ah or is it not a bid'ah? Uh, is this allowed? Is this not allowed? Are these the only things that remain? Absolutely not. There is kufr, which is widespread. Apostasy is spreading in the Muslim community. Major sins are spreading in the Muslim community. Shirk still exists in the Muslim community. There are people who are uh, rejecting the sunan of the Prophet وسلم, and they think that, uh, you know, truly following the Qur'an is to ignore the sunnah. Even though if anyone reads the Qur'an, they will know that the sunnah is part of the Qur'an. So we have this problem. We have the problem of uh, belittling the teachings of Islam. These are problems which exist in our communities amongst the Muslims. Are they not worthy of tackling? Yeah. We have people questioning the, the, the Day of Judgment and the Akhirah. We have people questioning the uh, you know, uh, things which are, have always been clear-cut, like some major sins. We have people questioning today whether homosexual practices are halal or haram. Are these not worthy of being refuted? You know, we have people uh, you know, doubting and uh, maybe questioning the role of the Prophet والسلام, Does he have to be followed? in the first place, you know. Uh, and so there is there is a lot for us to focus on. There's a lot for us to focus on. So the average Muslim should focus on the things which are clear. Bad akhlaq, incorrect belief, clear incorrect beliefs, okay? Uh, the committing of major sins, the, uh, you know, spreading of evil character and behavior. We can focus on these things. And then as a person develops in knowledge, they can start to point out more intricate issues, which are wrong, but they require a bit more depth in knowledge to be to be clarified. And so, you know, really, uh, for example, a lot of uh, brothers who uh, get into the da'wah scene and start to spread knowledge and preach and, and things like that, one of the worst mistakes that they fall into a lot of the time is they start to talk about other Muslim preachers. Who gave you this responsibility in the first place? Who gave you that responsibility in the first place? So someone's been giving da'wah for 25 years and you have just come into the uh, scene of teaching. Uh, maybe we, we shouldn't even be teaching. Maybe a lot of these people, not maybe, for sure, a lot of these people shouldn't be teaching, shouldn't be talking about Islam in the first place. But no problem. You've started to teach, you've started to remind, you've started to give a lecture, you've started to talk about this, and usually one thing leads to another. Usually a person starts off with something basic, like my journey to Islam, my journey from Jahiliyyah, like giving da'wah to non-Muslims, 
and this type of stuff. And then after one week, two weeks, one year, two years, it develops into fatwa on major political issues. How do things happen so quickly? So this person, the first thing he does is to talk about the intricate issues and to talk about matters in which scholars have given scope for disagreement and to criticize other Muslims who have been benefiting millions of Muslims around the world. This is a chaotic, really. This is absolutely chaotic. Someone who's been benefiting Muslims, bringing them to Islam, teaching them the Sunnah for 20 years, 30 years, he's the first person you want to target. And you've just come out. You've just learned the pillars of Islam and Iman and some essentials here and there. That's the first person you focus on? Isn't that chaotic? Isn't this what we spoke about in the beginning about not knowing priorities? And so absolutely refutations has its place. And refutations are wajib sometimes. But let me tell you something else. Uh, as well as the fact that refutations are important and that we should focus on the simple, clear things, talk about major sins, talk about the obligations, clear obligations, and the people who are more senior in knowledge, they should focus on the more intricate issues, okay? As well as that, the best way to overcome ignorance and overcome falsehood is simply to teach it. One of our mashayikh who teaches us Sahih al-Bukhari, um, and he's one of these scholars I had in mind when I spoke about senior scholars in age, and he's in his 60s. May Allah Ta'ala preserve him and increase in his example. Whenever I discuss this issue of refutations with him, he said, you know, Allahi, people don't just need information. You know, confusion isn't always about wrong information. Sometimes it's about our hearts not being pure and not being clean and not being prepared to take pure knowledge. So you're better off teaching. He says you're better off teaching and spreading knowledge. And that's the best way to overcome ignorance. Do you know? And sometimes when you get stuck in this back and forth of arguing with people and debating with people, like we see on social media, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you've occupied yourself and the Muslim community from learning a verse of the Quran, from learning a command of the Prophet, from learning a prohibition, from learning a sunnah. You've occupied them from that. So if we had people, if we had preachers who said, I, I'm not going to take, take part in this business, my duty and my way of refuting falsehood is to simply teach the Quran and its meanings, simply teach, to teach knowledge, teach Islamic sciences. When I teach these things and I spread these things in the Muslim community, with time, ignorance will be reduced so much. And with time, you're actually refuting without having to refute. And you're pointing out mistakes without having to be too specific about individuals or about things. So anyways, these are some scattered thoughts about this issue of refuting and things like that. I think that was, a, especially the last one about uh, problems being more than just information was very, very beneficial. And you also touched upon priorities again. So maybe as a last question, depending on time, there's a question from one of the brothers in the audience as well. What do you recommend for young brothers in who want to study the deen practically, if you can maybe lay out a small plan, five years, 10 years, both in terms of actual sciences they might need to study and also how they balance that with their relationship with Allah what can they do to both build a relationship with Allah but also increasing their knowledge what should come first and second and third and so forth طيب. Bismillah now um, the first thing I would uh, recommend uh, is like I said earlier to try and find a competent teacher who is senior in knowledge uh, and who is uh, capable of making some time it doesn't have to be personal time okay sometimes it, some some people want an unrealistic program you know they think we're still living in the in the day of the salaf where you can go to a teacher every single day to his house and spend two three hours with him that's very difficult to find so we we shouldn't be too unrealistic but if we can find a senior and competent teacher a person of knowledge who has good akhlaq and has iman and has taqwa if we can find that person khalas, then i don't need to answer this question okay so if you are able to find that person, then take advice from that person. Uh, you know, take the nasiha uh, of the that, that that person of knowledge. He'll guide you as to what to study, you know, what to do, and so on. Secondly, uh, I will say don't focus too much on the different books that you should study, and the different material that you should study, and focus more on having a teacher to study with. Yeah, so focus more on having the right teacher to study with than which book should I study. Is this appropriate? Is this not appropriate? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Definitely, there is a general order 
of studying knowledge so that knowledge is nice and easy and so that you know we can keep uh, consistency with knowledge but more important is is the the khuluq the character you know uh, in algeria when we were studying sahih al bukhari we had one brother who's very he was a beginner he was a beginner to islamic sciences but he still benefited hugely i could see just in 6 months one year his knowledge you know he improved so much even though sahih al bukhari is not usually the first thing that you would recommend for a student of knowledge but because we had such an incredible teacher you know he developed uh, his knowledge uh, extensively and he also developed his personality and character and of course so did i and all the other students with us so the point is having the competent teacher is more important than thinking about methodology having said that imam muslim rahimahullah when he wrote his book the sahih he said focusing on few authentic ahadith um is more important than focusing on so many ahadith so it is better for example it is better for a muslim to spend 2 years studying al arba'in and nawawiyah okay the 40 ahadith of an nawawi and umdat al ahkam and to study them well and maybe to memorize them and to revise them and revise them and revise them if you spend 2 years just focusing on that I believe you will be more advanced than most of the brothers and sisters who are looking to seek knowledge in the world. The reason is most brothers and sisters who seek knowledge their studies are all over the place. Lecture over here, lecture over there, courses starting here, courses still wallahi I've got some I've seen some brothers for 5 years, maybe 10 years, they're still asking me the same question on private messages. What's a good book to start with in aqida in the Hanbali madhhab? What's a good book to start with? I said you asked me this 10 years ago. 5 years ago if you still not found that book that's a that's a really big problem you know. So uh, focusing on little knowledge, simple knowledge and having the right teacher is really really essential. You know, having said that as a general rule you know if you can study something really simple in all the different important sciences and the main sciences in Islam are what? Arabic language uh usul al fiqh usul al hadith fiqh and the quran and hadith okay these are the main things that uh you know a muslim should study and focus on and and work hard on to develop in knowledge if you can grasp uh you know the essentials of these sciences and revise them over and over again i emphasize on revision i emphasize on revision a lot If you can focus on these things then you'll find yourself inclining to something and then you can go towards your inclination tafsir hadith fiqh usul fiqh whatever it is arabic that's not a problem okay but the main thing is to take something and repeat it over and over again and the worst thing we can do is to study a book study a book and then leave it and move on to the next book and this is called the this is a shahwa knowledge seeking knowledge has a desire as well and that desire is you always want to study something new But that desire can be really harmful it is better for you to study one book five times 10 times memorize it re- re- revise it repeat it keep checking your notes keep asking questions related to that than to study 10 books in that science take that you know as an advice from uh, all the senior scholars that uh, speak about this issue of methodology of learning uh, so you know in summary the right teacher and the basics of these important sciences that i touched upon and revise 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 don't in, don't have too many books that you're going through don't focus too much on different courses and different lessons stick to the simples simple basics and focus on those and repeat them over and over again and you will find yourself above the majority of students of knowledge and then it's easy to build after that inshallah ta'ala jazakallah khairan shaykh allah fiikum and i apologize for the lengthy answers and uh, No problem at all, Sheikh. Unfortunately, we're out of time. There are a few more questions, but we will we'll break in a moment, inshallah. Give brothers and sisters a chance to make dua before Maghrib. Uh, before we close, do you have any closing remarks, inshallah? Maybe one or two minutes, a nasiha, anything to add before we finish? Yeah, I'm, Allah, my, you know, Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, uh, was asked by his son, he said, if you pass away, who should we go to? So he mentioned someone, and someone said to him you know there are people who are more knowledgeable than him he said but he is a 
He's a man of iman and taqwa. فحريون أن يوفق للصواب. So it's more likely that he'll be guided to the truth. You know, really, uh, sometimes when it comes to knowledge and speaking about path and speaking about the truth and speaking about, uh, you know, uh, different groups, etc., we focus so much on these uh, things, you know, titles of books and, and uh, the names of groups and who are the true scholars of Islam and who are the scholars with mistakes. And we focus so much on these things. This is not uh, what's going to bring us closer to Allah Ta'ala. This is not really the objective of knowledge. The objective of knowledge is that it increases our iman and it gives us the strength to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so therefore, you know, always seek knowledge with this in mind. Always seek knowledge and study with this in mind. The, the, in my, with the, uh, you know, objective and intention to come closer to Allah ta'ala, to have better sincerity in your worship, to keep away from sins, uh, to keep away from bad character, to keep away from diseases of the heart, uh, and also, you know, to, to understand the things which Allah wants us to understand. And they are the things which Allah has clarified uh, in the Qur'an and the Prophet ﷺ has, uh, has taught us in his, his teaching. So therefore, you know, whenever, uh, you know, we talk about knowledge and seeking knowledge, etc., never, ever, ever lose sight of these things. Otherwise, you know, it would be a disaster if we spend five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years thinking that we're seeking knowledge, thinking that we're being practicing and religious but we still haven't uh, been able to uh, you know, worship Allah Ta'ala with, with khushu'ah. We still haven't been able to leave showing off and, and giving more importance to people uh, and what they think of us. And still leave, uh, we haven't been able to leave major sins and, mi and, and minor sins, which are habits within us. That means that there's a problem with our religiosity. It means there's a problem with our practicing of Islam. It means there's a problem with our seeking knowledge. That doesn't mean to leave seeking knowledge, but it means that we need to really correct the path Otherwise, this knowledge will be an argument against us on the Day of Judgment as opposed to being an argument for us. So, you know, that's what I what I have on this issue. May Allah give us all success and continue to make dua, give us the strength to, uh, you know, purify our hearts from any illnesses and diseases. And ultimately, that's where success is, inshallah ta'ala. Barakallahu feekum. May Allah reward you and grant you success in the dunya and akhirah. Ameen. Barakallahu feekum. Shaykh. Uh, for your time today, for your nasih, for your advice of wisdom. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who can action everything that we've heard, who um, bring us every, make us from those who our knowledge brings us closer to him, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, before we close, I'll share on the screen, I hope you can see it, next week's session with Imam Muhammad Mahmoud, the Imam of Islam the Mosque, one of the Imams of Islam the Mosque, and he will be covering the topic of dealing with doubts, remaining firm in troubling times, inshallah. So that's something to look forward to. That will be next week, same time, inshallah ta'ala. But this uh, this brother has mistakes, so I warn you against him. <laughs> For those of you who are not used to talk about him, is joking, I believe. That was a joke, that was a joke. Inshallah, I, you know, I've, I've had a brief look at all the uh, lessons on, on Friday, on uh, Friday shutdown. Mashallah, all of them are good, and I'm sure this one will be, you know, even better, inshallah. Barakallah, people. Barakallah. Jazakallah khair. That's all we have to... Say today we'll close there inshallah. Subhanakallah wa hamdik nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Jazakum khairan Sheikh Said hopefully we'll see you soon. Wa iyyakum wa barakallahu fiik wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.